scripture lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians. These are very, very familiar words, but I want to maybe think about them in a different way this morning. First Corinthians, actually beginning the very last part of chapter 12, verse 31, and then into 1 Corinthians 13. And I will show you still a more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. It is not envious or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known." And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For those of you who are married, how many of you had those words read at your wedding? You can raise your hands. It's okay. We can raise hands in church. So we... So, these, this is the love chapter. It's, there are some brides and grooms these days that will say, you know, everybody has that red at their wedding. Can I have something different red? And I ask them to think about it and pray about it. Because I tell them that, yes, these words have been read by many, many people, but there is a reason these words have been read. A number of you are aware that this has been one of those incredibly special weekends for me as a pastor. Uh, I've said several times in the last few weeks that there are just more blessings than I can ever count to being in ministry. Uh, But this weekend has been a full and wonderful weekend. We celebrated the life of a dear saint on Friday. I, I had the opportunity to officiate a wedding last night and this morning. We baptized an infant. If we'd have had communion this morning, I could have knocked it all out in one weekend. But we think about this text this morning, and we think about all three of those events, and and, and particularly this weekend, with all three of these families, there was no doubt in my mind that love was at the center of what we were doing. No doubt in my mind. And as we think about this text that's so often read at weddings, we dig a little deeper. First, we have to r- recognize that, that we have to read it in context because just before this is 1 Corinthians 12, and it's a text that I've preached on a number of times, one of my favorite sermons I've preached is on 1 Corinthians 12. And 1 Corinthians 12 talks about uh, the body of Christ, and it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And what's happening in the church is everybody's arguing about who's more important and whose gift is more special. And, and, and Paul uses the metaphor of the body to describe the church. And, and what Paul essentially says is, look, None of you are any more important than the other. In fact, you all are dependent on one another. 
Just as the body has all of these parts to work together in unison to make you who you are, the body of Christ has various different parts and gifts and people that all have to come together to work in unison so that you can be the church that you need to be. And so, Paul transitions from kind of, not lecturing, but encouraging the church to get along. And he says, but I will show you a more excellent way. And that's when he proceeds with this beautiful poem that's kind of broken down into four parts, depending on how your, your Bible um, does the breaks of the paragraphs. So, you know, originally, the Bible had no paragraphs and no verses. They're all kind of created by people who translated the Bible, and over time, they've, they've decided what parts of text belong together, and this is one of the circumstances where I think they got it wrong, because I think, I think you got to have that first part of the last verse of chapter 12, but, but there were no verses, and it was just all kind of one long run-on writing, and they've broken it down for us. But this is a poem, and, and, and Paul writes it as a poem. And he starts off about what happens if you don't have love. And basically what Paul says in that first section is that without love, life is pretty meaningless. That nothing we do in life, if, if done with, everything we do in life, if done without love, just doesn't have the same impact. So he starts by saying, by telling us what it's like without love. And then he defines love. He tells us what it is, and he tells us what it is not. Patience. We think about the gift of patience. Um, I know a lot of really patient people in this world. I'm not one of them. My wife is not one of them. Stefan says his wife is not one of them. People are, point, people are pointing fingers in the church this morning. Anybody want to admit that you're, you aren't a, pa- a patient person? And we're going we're to raise it. Okay, so we're pointing fingers at both directions. Think about true patience and how much love is required to be patient. As parents with children, for I think it was Zach's first two years, he really did not sleep at all for two years. And when we, you know, we didn't do the whole whatever book that tells you how to get, we just, well, we'll figure this out. Two years later, on the other end of the spectrum, when we have aging and ailing parents, family, the patience required to be by their side, to love them, to care for them, and everything in between, patience with people who we don't know. I get so frustrated myself when I'm impatient with with service workers or service providers or someone on the phone because here's what none of us know. When we're in line at the store or in the drive through at, well, I'll just go ahead and say it, Chick-fil-A, selfish self-promotion for the bride. We're in line at the store, we're in the drive through we're on the phone with customer service or as Clark Howard calls it, customer no service. And we get someone on the other side of the counter or through the window or on the other side of the phone, we have no idea what their day has been like, what they're experiencing, what their life is like. Whether or not they're experiencing trouble at home or at work or with family or friends. And I will tell you the most embarrassing part for me is, particularly if I'm on the phone, at some point, if the person on the other side says, so what do you do? Yeah, 
Think about that one for a minute. It's when I tell my I also am in customer service. Rep- represent a multinational corporation that seeks to serve others and Love is kind. We've talked about this a lot recently, but it is so easy to be kind. I mean, it doesn't, it requires far more effort to be mean than it does just to be kind. But God calls us to be kind, even with those with whom we've grown impatient. It costs not one time to smile at someone, to say an encouraging word, to write a note of thanks. None of that costs anything. Here's where we get in trouble. It's not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. We live in a world where I'm afraid that we've allowed culture to draw us into this time in which we celebrate when other people get hurt or fall. And the worst part about it is often we're the ones that have placed these people on a pedestal before we knock it out from under them. Well, I'm looking around, Ann, Ann Weider's not here this morning, but Ann was Zach's first grade teacher. And one of the, you learn so many, they say every, you know, everything you learn, need to know you learned in first grade. Everything I need to know I learned when Zach was in first grade. And one of, one of, one of, what Miss Weidert's favorite sayings was, don't yuck my yum. Think about that for a minute. If I say, man, I love something, and you go, oh, that's nasty. Don't yuck my yum. If I, you know, love a naked dog and a chili only dog and an apple pie and an F.O. And Shannon says, she's shaking her head right now. Don't yuck my yum. Encourage one another. Love one another. Rather than seeing everything that's wrong in the world, see what is right with the world. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Then he starts in this next section talking about all the things that, that fail in life. Prophecies, tongues. So that was the big one. And if it, any of you grew up in churches or have attended churches where they speak in tongues, you know, for some communities, that's just, that's the end all be all. That if you can speak in tongues, that is a, that is a clear indicator of your faith in God and your spiritual gifts. Prophecy, the ability to tell the truth in love. And then we get to kind of this section that kind of defines this weekend that these families have all been at some part of this weekend. When I was a child, I spoke like a child and I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. Now, there's part of that we talk a lot about that a childlike faith, not a childish faith, but a childlike faith is important. And I think when Paul writes this, he's not writing about our faith that we gain as children to go away. But the fact of the matter is, children are generally pretty selfish. They need to be. They have to be. They, that's how they learn to grow, and they need to be fed. They need to be nourished. It's the human nature And so for love, we have to evolve from the time when we're children, when it's all about us, to learning that it's really all about God, and thus it's all about others. And I love this, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. 
So over the last few weeks, as we've lost the saints of the church, we've said at each service that we know as they left us here, they saw face to face the God who created them and sustained them and loved them and encouraged them. I know only in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. Most of you have probably heard the the metaphor of the great tapestry and that that one of the metaphors of of life and understanding life is that as we look up at the backside of a tapestry, it's just a a maze and a a nest of of knots and and yarn or, or thread. But when you flip the tapestry over, you see the beauty of the image that's been created. There are some things we just can't know this side of heaven. There are just some things that, that, that are beyond our ability to comprehend or understand. And every stage of life brings with it the opportunity to learn more, to grow more, and to move toward what in Wesleyan theology we call moving on to perfection. And when we ask, when we're asked in, in our ordination vows, do you expect to be made perfect in this lifetime? Christian perfection, as John Wesley defines it, is loving as God has loved. The ability to love so patiently and with such kindness without any of the human strings attached to it that we just love in its purest form. probably officiated a couple hundred weddings in my ministry, and each one of them's different, and each one of them is special, but there are some that you just, you just know that at that moment, the couple gets it. A couple I married this weekend, before anything else, they wanted this, this worship song saying, and, it, and it's, the, 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 the line was, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. The first thing this couple wanted to do after everyone had been seated before a word was spoken was to acknowledge the presence of God in that place and in their lives and at the center of their marriage. And so where all of this comes full circle, some of you heard this on Friday, but you're going to hear it again, and, and I promise you that it is Something you will want to hear again. And Terry talked about her mom. This is what she said was the most important thing. That as children, they knew that their parents loved God, that their parents loved each other, and that their parents loved them. And over the course of this entire weekend, what I know is that was true. And then what I know is true about Steph and Holly is I know They love God. I know they love each other, and I know they love Connor, and that someday Connor's going to be able to say the same words that Terry spoke. And the couple that stood in front of the altar, in front of the people who knew them best and loved them most last night, when I looked at them and watched them look at each other's eyes, I know that they love God and they love each other. I know that their parents love God and love each other and love them. Now, none of us are perfect, and all of us make mistakes, and, and, and there are more second chances than any of us deserve, but in Christ, there's second chance after second chance after second chance. But throughout this weekend and over the last few weeks, and, 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 and particularly in those words, I've become convinced that that is the key, that as we read this text, that what Paul is trying to say is the most important thing we can do is love God love each other, and love the world. Because I'm convinced that if we will do that, we will find the more excellent way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.